Tony Curry, a man of enormous giganticness in radio. <laughs> I'm, I'm so honored to have you here. That's we've known each other a long time, but we've never actually yeah. been able to have an actual chat. So now we're no, and this is a real this is a real big deal. I'm really excited about this, Richard, because so there's a lot to chat about. Yeah, there's a hell of a lot. And plus, here's the thing: the great thing about radio, Richard, is you can interview me and I can interview you at the same time, mm -hmm. and it doesn't really matter because we're both extremely handsome. <laughs> oh, you silver tongue flatterer. <clears throat> but but I, I loved what you just said to me before we came on. You said, if it's pictures, it's, it's television. Well, it is because um, whatever you like to pretend it is, you know, podcasts, live streaming, all that kind of rubbish. If it's got pictures and sound combined, it is television. No matter what you might think, that is what it is. Mm. And if you approach it that way, it very often makes it much better. I wanted to talk to you about why we both do this thing that we do. I mean, I do, we're obsessive. do other things, but yeah. you know, why bother? And, and what, what started you into wanting to do the thing that you do? I started doing this uh, when I was uh, four, I think it was. Um, and my dad brought home a tape recorder and he had rented it. I mean, we're talking about way back in the early 1950s and dad had rented a tape recorder for a week and bought a reel of tape, came home and we did all those silly things that you used to do in the 1950s. We sang around the tape recorder and we recorded our voices and they mm. played it back and we kind of went, Ooh! and I was left alone with it for an hour or so. And I started intuitively being a continuity announcer. <laughs> and uh, if you'd warned me, I could have dug out the tape because it goes something like this. It's, this is the Anthony Home Service. It is now six o'clock. Beep, 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 beep. Here Very is the good. news. The prime minister has done something, you know. And I recorded all this stuff. And it was quite obvious when you listen to it now that that's, that's where my career uh, lay. And then a, 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 about a year later, Dad bought Mum a tape recorder for Christmas, and it was quite a good one. It was a, it was a Philips, and it, it worked reasonably well. And so I would beg to be allowed to have an hour alone with the tape recorder at regular intervals. And by a process of stealth, eventually the tape recorder was mine and i would do all sorts of things with that tape recorder and i would just experiment and then in 1962 i uh came up with this crackpot idea of starting a radio station in my attic now i was only 10 and but i thought no we can do this we can do this and i had two clockwork wind up gramophones the old-fashioned type you just you know no batteries or anything like that you just wind them up put the needle on the record nice and i had a an old ex-army microphone and i would put it into the sound box of one gramophone and then i'd say now here's another record and put it into the sound box of another gramophone and thus uh, radio six was born and uh, since then it has blossomed into an international internet station uh, heard in 205 countries. And I've spent 58 years, more or less, earning a living from radio and television. I've done them both. Having worked from the BB, for the BBC myself, I, I, I think the making a living part is very special. You should it is. I, I had 22 years with the BBC on the staff. And I, I really shouldn't say anything nasty about my ex-employer because, after all, they pay my pension. Um, but let's just say it had its moments. Right, right. Well, I, I can't say that they pay my pension, um, nor can I say I particularly made a living out of it, although I did it for about 20 years. But nevertheless, 
I enjoyed the hell out of it. And uh, so I, I don't say anything bad about it. It was And I enjoyed the hell out of your programs, Richard, because there were some of the best things Radio 2 did because they had an edge that a lot of Radio 2 didn't have. Well, only because, you know, my, my entire reason for doing radio in the first place was just to explain stuff as a musician, as a, mm -hmm. as a producer, as a guy who'd worked with a lot of great artists. It's always regarded as an airy-fairy kind of thing. It's not. It's hard work. And, and there are practical processes which you have to go through to do each step of the procedure and I wanted to reveal the behind the scenes uh, nuts and bolts of the whole thing and so that was that was my whole thing and then of course I like to have fun mm. so I I had a sense of humor about it only to keep myself awake so <laughs> so I mean that was that was the reason I did it I enjoy explaining stuff to people which is why when I teach I enjoy teaching and why I wrote all the books that I've written about music because I enjoy explaining stuff yeah well you see you and I are very very similar I mean I've written three books explaining stuff yes, you have. Um, one is the concise history of British television which is very much an explaining book because it was written for students um, and I've done other stuff. But the, but the thing is, I like explaining stuff too. And uh, the weekly radio program that I do here, uh, although I run a complete radio station, but I mean, I do, I reserve one hour a week to do the thing I really like best, which is playing instrumental pop and explaining about it and talking about it and the people who made it and where mm -hmm. they did it and why they did it and all that kind of stuff. Oh. People watching this should understand that when you do something like this, you never know who's watching right. and what they will take from it. Right. And I will tell a little story. About hmm, three or four years ago, I did an interview program. I, d I do lots of interviews. I like doing interviews because I'm interested in people. And I did an interview with a man called Mark Miller. Now, Mark Miller... Uh, is a fellow Scotsman, and he uh, came into my sphere through both my daughter and my wife. And he agreed to do an interview. And I was very excited because I'd actually wanted to interview him for about five or six years because he had been the man who wrote Spider-Man, Spider-Man comics, and then he'd moved from Spider-Man to Superman, so he'd gone from Marvel to DC. And then he'd realized that you never made money out of somebody else's work. Um, you had to create your own character. So he created his own comic empire and he created his own characters. And sooner or later, they turned into films and he did Kick-Ass and then he did the Kingsman series. Right. And then he was uh, his entire business was bought by Netflix for an undisclosed sum. But it would make your eyes water. Yeah. So we're doing this interview, and I'm, I'm. He, this guy is quite, you know, big. I, I think he's great, and I'm, I admire him, and I'm enjoying having him in, in the studio and talking to him. So I asked him the sort of question that every interviewer asks, which is, and what was it that made you go into the world of comics, Mark Miller? Indeed. And he looked at me across the table and said, "You did." And I went, "What?" And he said, "You did." And I said, no, it, well, well, what do you mean? Explain yourself. He said, well, I was seven. And I was watching the television on a Sunday afternoon, the number one kids program in Scotland, Glenn Michaels Cavalcade. And Glenn and I knew each other very well. And very often when he didn't have anything to put in his program, he'd haul me in and say, just talk for 20 minutes about something. So this particular afternoon, I decided to talk about the history of comics. And I brought in lots of examples. I brought in the very first comic, which was called Ali Sloper's Half Holiday from 1873. And I just talked, as I do, and I explained how comics were written by a writer and then there was an artist and then an inker who coloured the artwork and an editor and storyliners and all this kind of stuff. Here's Mark, seven years old, watching the telly going... I could do this for a living. Indeed. And he does. Yeah. But 
I, you know, when I was doing this program, I, I, the last thing on my mind was that I would influence anybody watching to go into the comics business, but mm. I did. Yeah. So you never know whether when your own mission to explain, your own enthusiasm, your own excitement will spark off something in somebody else. Absolutely. And, and I've been very pleased over the years. You know, we get letters. Uh, letters at Radio City. No, uh, but you know we get letters and and uh, people say, "Wow, you know I, I didn't know that about so and so, and I went out and I got six records of so and so, and now I'm trying to do something myself, which is in that direction, which is great." You know, I mean, I love when that happens because I I quite often get letters from people saying. I, I heard you play X and I've gone out and bought all their albums or I heard you play Y and I've now learned to play it on the trumpet or the trombone or whatever. Mm. Um, and that I don't care if there's only five people listening. I really don't. Right. Because I'm, you know, it's not about money. But if only five people are listening, but every one of those five have a really good time for the hour that I'm on. Right. Hey. Well, that's what I, that's what I feel about Radio Richard because, you know, I've just started this, uh, a couple of months ago, and those subscribers who I do have, it really is is a great feeling because at least I know somebody's hearing the stuff and somebody is enjoying it, and they and they write back to me. So if it doesn't give me right now, I would say uh, financial uh, stroking, it gives me a nice uh, uh, kind of emotional uh, stroking uh, because because I know that people are enjoying what I what I've been doing. Isn't the emotional stroking more important than the financial one, really? <laughs> well, all is said and done. it's important. Yes, I mean the financial one is important too because we have to eat. You can't you can't eat love. You can. We're now in 2021, and we have all of these means of casting. You know, it mm -hmm. used to be broadcasting, or that's that's what we had, and all of these different things have come up, and you've embraced, and I've embraced many of them and i'd like to know how you feel about the difference between podcasting uh blogging uh putting up videos on youtube having a youtube channel how would you kind of compare and contrast the different options available to people today uh, first of all can i just give you a tiny little history lesson please do because it is important to consider where all this came from I'm talking to you from Scotland. In fact, I'm talking to you from a Hebridean island, the island of Lismore. Tiny little island. It's only 12 miles by two. It's 170 people live here. Makes no odds. I can run an international radio station with listeners in 205 countries from here, or indeed from anywhere on the planet, pretty much. The point of it all is communication. Now, when it started, uh, Radio in Scotland started in 1905. And a man called Fessenden was doing experiments with um, transatlantic radio. This was all Morse. I mean, we're talking, we're talking way, way back in history. And every communication was Morse code. It was da 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 all that stuff. Nice. And uh, they built a 450-foot mast on the in Macrihanish on the tip of the Mull of Kintyre to try and pick up radio signals from America, which they did. And one night, the guy in America was experimenting. And the guy sitting in Macrihanish with his headphones on, instead of hearing da da di, da da da, heard the voice of the man in America who was operating the transmitter. And this was the very first voice contact across the Atlantic. And two days later, there was a gale and the 450 foot mast fell down. Oh. Moral of the story, don't build a 450 foot mast of wood. Then in 1922, uh, radio as a, as a means of entertainment sort of grew up in this country. And in 1923, the first radio station in Scotland was a commercial radio station in Glasgow run by two men who ran it to try and make a bit of money. And tape recording, disc recording, all these things were impossible at that time. So everything had to be live and they would bring orchestras and singers and speakers into the studio and they would perform live and people would listen. And 
to a very large extent, that was the best way, the cheapest way, the easiest way for people at home to listen to music and speech and le lectures and news and weather and communications like that. It was taken over by the BBC the year later, and the BBC grew into a network of stations around the country. But the point of the BBC was always the same thing, to inform, educate and entertain. And for a very long time, radio was the only means that people had of learning about the world. Well, they had newspapers and they had books. But a lot of people didn't read newspapers and far more people didn't read books, but they listened and they got all this stuff. So originally, radio was about a mixture of bringing music to you that you'd never heard before. And to a very large extent, the BBC did that in spades by uh, forming their own orchestras and playing symphony concerts every night and teaching the population the value of Beethoven, Debussy, Vorjak, Stockhausen. And that was the musical side of it. Then there was the dance band side of it, and they would play records of current dance band music every night from half past 10 till midnight, and people would listen to it and enjoy themselves. And in between it, there would be lectures from eminent men of the day about all sorts of things. It was very good, actually. And we seem to have lost it to a very large extent. Because I tried to count, before we started this chat, I tried to count how many radio stations there are in Britain, and I just lost count. I think there's 300, maybe 400, I don't know. And most of them are poxy little radio stations run by communities where the people performing know nothing about how to speak in front of a microphone, know nothing about how to shape a program and give it some kind of uh, exchange with a listener. And they just do it because they can and they fail mostly. Mm. Commercial radio has become uh, a big, very good money-making business on the basis that it plays non-stop music with minimal interruptions other than the commercials. Mm. So radio plays, ooh, many radio stations actually around the world, not just in the UK, but everywhere, have a playlist of maybe 50 tracks that they just keep churning round and round again. Uh, on the basis that familiarity breeds affection. Well, maybe it breeds contempt as well. Mm. Um, I find it utterly depressing because I started uh, my uh, professional career, actually I started my professional career in America uh, with KPFK in Los Angeles, which was a wonderful yeah. station and still is. Mm. But Radio Clyde was the first commercial station in Scotland and I was the first voice on it, and I produced the first night's programme. So I have an attachment to this. Yes. And, and now I find commercial radio is dull, drab, unexciting, and frankly, if I want to listen to something, I can just as easily stick a little memory stick into my car and play my favourite records in right. you know random, random shuffle. Well, if I may interrupt you, just at mm. this point, you brought up some stuff that's kind of some of my pet peeves um, please please peeve one away of the things that you said was that they mean they just play music with no interruptions well i i don't call it interruptions one of the reasons i mean look you and i are sadly the exact same age yes so, so the thing is, <laughs> don't remind me richard during during the 60s certainly you and i at least and and i might say separately were under our bedclothes listening to little transistor radios, listening to Radio mm -hmm. Caroline and, mm -hmm. and the various pirate radio stations. And the thing that I loved so much about them is that the DJs, because I listened to the, whatever station I could get, you know, but the DJs talked about the, the artists, you know, they would say, wow, that was the new record by so-and-so. And then they'd talk about so-and-so and you'd learn something about who they were, where they were from, uh, this was recorded by so and so. You get information about this music that you love, but why do I love it? Now I love it more because I've got some information on it. I love the, the track even more. Now, while I was doing radio, that was what I wanted to do. I wanted to talk about 
the things that I was playing. I had people come in my studio. Like yourself, I recorded all of my stuff at home, in my home studio. So I could have Michael Brecker come into my studio and play, but then I could say, hey, Mike, what was that? Tell me about that, you know, and what, what, tell me about your new record and why did you do this? And why did you, you know, it was fantastic. So, but also it's good radio. Yeah. I, well, I think it's good radio because I want to do what the BBC actually said they wanted to do, which was, you know, educate and entertain at the same time. And, and yet while I was at the BBC, sadly, I started out and everything was groovy. And then suddenly they kept saying, okay, well, you need to get more famous people in and we need more famous people in. And I, and I you know, and, and can you direct this towards more pop stars? After all, you work oh, yeah. with pop stars. Why don't oh, you get yeah. them in? And, and ideas that I had for shows were, which were, I thought, great ideas were turned down because it wasn't, you know, commercial enough in terms of having stars. And then my radio format was taken from me of my show, New Jazz Standards. Mm -hmm. And they put a different name on it, put some celebrity presenters on it. Yeah. Bob was no longer my uncle. But of course, the, the, the failing here, it, first of all, it's a fear. It's a fear of failure on the part of the management of, let's not just accuse BBC Radio 2 of no, this. No, I'm not accusing anybody. All radio is, 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 but they all have this fear of failure. And they all look at the audience numbers. And they go home at night and they watch television. They don't go home at night and listen to the radio. No, they certainly don't. They don't. They go home at night and watch television. So all of their ideas are driven by who they see on television. So they switch on the television and they see somebody like, let's take somebody who I actually like. They see somebody like Alan Titchmarsh. Right. Who's a gardener. He's a gardener right. from top to bottom. He right. does fabulous gardening programs. He's a gardening man. Yeah. So Radio 2 say, hey, Alan, come into the studio and play some records. Why? I mean, they may as well say, hey, Alan, you're a great gardener. Come and do a brain operation. Yes, I, I totally agree. But this this is now the form. And it's not just in the UK. It happens everywhere. But but it, it then, Tony, it, it, that, that very thing goes into politics. Somebody who shall remain nameless. And, and he becomes the leader of the party. He becomes the, because he's got name recognition. They're always talking yeah. about name recognition. It's yeah. more important than policies. It's more important than the pound in your pocket. It's just name recognition and, and buffoonery and uh, gross behavior. It's well, now, of course, now you're talking about all sorts of politicians, so we couldn't yes, pin it on any I don't want to get into politics on this program, which is mainly about music. <laughs> Joan, but, it's very dangerous. It is, it is. And, and you know, they'll put a hit out on me. But nevertheless, what I'm saying is this name recognition thing uh, took the fun out of it for me. And mm. so that's why I stopped doing it. And and uh, and so now I think what I want wanted you to kind of get around to, and now I'm going to bludgeon you until you talk about it, is the fact that there is total freedom without the salary. In, in a way, for many people who want to cast. I don't want to yeah. call it broadcast. Maybe you want to call everything broadcasting. But nevertheless, okay. there is no, total freedom of choice. I do know where you want me to go on this. And, uh -huh. and, and I am getting there. Thank you. We have a stagnant commercial radio industry. It's stagnant in Britain. It's stagnant in America. It's even more stagnant in Australia. It's fairly stagnant in New Zealand. It's very stagnant in some parts of the country. Um, so what happens? People find new ways of doing things. Now, I have to tell you that there's a horrible end to what I'm going to say. Oh, good. And it's a horrible end because it's something that happened 
today, the day that we're recording this. Many of us became as frustrated as you by the confines of the environment that we were being asked to broadcast in. Most people, I imagine, watching this aren't actually broadcasters. Probably musicians. A lot of musicians watch you. Um, but we all have the same kind of compelling need to do what we do. And when I was four, I wanted to do it. I, I didn't want to make money out of it. I just wanted to do it. I've been lucky. I've made money out of it all my life. But we now have this environment where radio is stale. Along comes, first of all, cable. Now, I know cable is long forgotten, but cable was the first place where, more so in America than the UK, but in the UK as well, but it was the first place where there was an outlet that wasn't strictly controlled by lack of frequencies or lack of transmitters or the FCC coming along telling you you can't say this and you can't say that. There were one or two little flowers bloomed in the early days of cable in USA and Canada and also in the UK. And people realised that there was perhaps another way to reach the audience. You might not make money out of it, but you could get, as we say, bums on seats. Mm. And I started a cable radio network in 1985. Um, and we put Radio 6 on cable, and it was um, an underwhelming success because the cable companies hadn't actually cabled up either Glasgow or Aberdeen, which is where we were. And we had about 15 listeners or something like that. They loved it, but 15 listeners ain't going to make you any money. And I lost a packet of money on that one. But it did open my eyes to something that you could do. One night, my elder son, Leo, came home and said, Dad, you've got that lovely radio studio downstairs and you're not doing anything. Why don't we set up an internet radio station? Now, I'd spent quite a large chunk of my life trying to set up radio stations and at that time, you had to go through all sorts of hoops. You had to apply to the Independent Broadcasting Authority. You had to produce a business plan. You had to have a board of directors of, of the great and the good. They had to be people who knew nothing about radio, but they had titles. You know, Sir This, Lord That, Lady This. And you would put in uh, an application, and you'd get two or three interviews, and then they'd give you the franchise. And it would take two years to build a transmitter and get the money in and all that stuff. That was what I was accustomed to. That was the environment I had been led to believe was setting up a new radio station. So Leo comes home. Goes, hey, Dad, why don't we set up an internet radio station? Yes, let's try that. How long will that take? He looked at me and he said, well, it's 10 to 5. Do you want to start at 5 o'clock? And I kind of went... Huh? They said, no. Do you want to start at five o'clock? I said, yeah, okay, we'll start at five o'clock. I thought, he's mad. So at five o'clock, we went online. And that's 21 years ago. And I said to him, but wait a minute, we're online, we're playing music, and I'm talking and all this stuff, but nobody knows we're here. How? I mean, come on, this is crazy. Nobody knows we're here. How are they going to find us? Now, do you remember that wonderful movie, Field of Dreams? Yep. If we build it, they will they come. Will come. Right. We built it, they came. Yeah. I never, ever told anybody what we were doing, and yet within a couple of months, we had listeners all over the world. Right. Now, in 21 years, I've never made a halfpenny out of broadcasting on the internet. Right. Not a halfpenny. But the fun I and about 40 of my friends have had is immeasurable. You can't put a price on fun. Right. It's been great. Right. Now, along the line, um, some of us split off a bit and went into podcasting. Right. 
And podcasting is a slightly different thing. So let me explain the difference for those who are a a bit confused. Internet radio, webcasting, streaming, is producing a live program, just like an FM station, that goes out 24 hours a day, but is live all the time. Well, actually, it's not. It comes from a computer, but hey, FM stations do as well. Right. But you can't predict what's going to play, and you don't know what's just played unless you look it up on the internet. Podcasting, which is what you do, is producing a defined program of some sort, maybe an audio program or a video program. Or both, in my case. Or both. And putting it up there so that people can download it or just watch it when they are available to view. Indeed. Now, this is in many ways perfection when it comes to broadcasting, because <clears throat> people always complained uh, that the BBC or ABC or NBC or CBS or whoever determined when they could hear something, and sometimes that didn't suit them at all. Now you've got your favourite programme in a little bottle on the internet, and you just go clickety-click. And it might be 3 a.m. on a Tuesday. But if that's when you want to listen to it, watch it, it's there. Now, this has made shed loads of money for Netflix and Amazon and all the others. Mm. It's made shed loads of money for Spotify. Right. Because they, they provide you with the means by which you can just say, hey, do you know, I'd love to hear the Beatles sing Hey Jude. Click, there it is. Yeah, I mean, some of my biggest listenership for Radio Richard at the moment is Spotify, which is amazing to me. Uh, Well, it's even more amazing to me because I run a little record label. It's a very small record label. I mean, in the great hierarchy of record labels, it's probably the seven millionth lowest. Well, size isn't everything, Tony. And we have a tiny repertoire and we do Spotify. I make actual money out of spotify Mm. i don't make any money out of downloads but i make money out of spotify and yet spotify pay me the record label not point not not one pence when somebody listens to a track now you think not point not not one pence i mean that's crazy money that's nothing well, That's Zippo. Well, unless you have millions of listeners, in which case oh. it's enough for a cup of coffee. But Richard, we we are we are Spotifying some utterly obscure music. It's sort of TV themes and stuff like that. Right. And yet each month I get about two hundred pounds well, from Spotify, nice. which nice. proves that. But it pro- what it proves is that there are millions of people out there who want to listen to, watch something that isn't being provided by the conventional AM, FM, or TV stations. And I think think the thing is, what you provide with your programs and what I provide with my programs is stuff they can't get anywhere else. Exactly. The only reason I've been successful is because I've got one place where you can hear actual interviews by people like Michael McDonald or Richard Carpenter or Barry Manilow or any of these people. Or Nile Rogers. Where else can you go? Or Nile Rogers. Where else can you hear these kind of interviews? Well, you can't. Same thing with your programs. And I think that's fantastic because the it's access to something that they're not they're certainly not getting it in school and they're not getting it in music schools no what i found that's very interesting is that a lot of music teachers have written to me and said wow this is a great resource for my students i've told all my students about this and and of course it's exactly what i hoped would happen so so that's a really great thing that we both do is we we find stuff that or we have stuff that's, that, that it, no, one, no one else can get or no one else can find. And we also 
give our input into it because let's face it, the opinion of someone of our advanced age is kind of useful if, yeah. if you're explaining something that somebody doesn't know about. Well, I know about it because I've lived my whole life about this subject. And Me too. here's what I know and mm. uh, enjoy it. And, and what do you think? And that's the other thing that I think we both do is we ask people to say, what do you think? I, I love to get people's opinions. And yes, so do I. And 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 the lovely thing about doing this, now this is this is also quite interesting, is uh, fifty eight years in radio. So I I, I spent a, a humongous amount of my life on AM FM radio, um, and I would get a few letters, a few. And most of them were much the same. They'd say, oh, Trini, I think you have great. I love you. Can you send me a photograph, please? Or they would say, oh, I love your show. I think it's great. By the way, do you know Tiger Tim? Can you get his photograph? Yeah. And that was that was the level. I mean, it was very you down market. And your mother so Jimmy letters, did you? <laughs> Uh, yeah, and it was it was very down market, but Radio Clyde reached. Um, I think at the time I was there, we reached about one point five million listeners. Brilliant. Now I'm reaching with Radio Six. I mean, our, you know, it's an internet station. You don't get huge numbers. We have a regular uh, cum, an annual cum. Of about forty-four thousand. Wow. Now it's not a big number, well, but these are people who. Me. But these are people who are with us. Yeah. Not every day, but mm -hmm. often every week for their appointment to listen. And we get letters. We all get letters. You get letters that you actually really want to respond to, right, because right, yeah. they tap into something in your own brain right. that says, "Oh, this is my subject. I love it." Yeah, yeah, great. And that's the difference. Because I, I actually have to tell you, 22 years at the BBC, I never had a letter. Never once. <clears throat> I got I got letters, especially with uh, the New Jazz Standard show. I mean, that's that was a great show. Was that was a great show. They Jingle went on too long, but it was a great show. That, that anyone had while I was doing the show. And mm. that was why I was so surprised when it was cancelled. Because I said, look, you say you've had a thousand letters since we started doing this, and you say that it's it's gotten this great reaction. Why are you doing this? And it, and I got dead silence. But I yeah. realized that I didn't have the celebrity name recognition thing going on as much as other people could. As much as a politician. Well, yes. yes. Or a footballer. Or yeah. somebody who who has never in their lives spent four seconds working out how to do radio. And, and I also think there's a there's a value to them in specializing because people love to put labels on things. And my entire career has been one of saying what Duke Ellington said, which is that there's good music and there's bad music, but the mm. labels are basically for the lazy, in my opinion. Yes, and 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 actually, you're ta you're touching into something that's also very important about radio, because twenty uh, first century radio is totally boxed in and defined by genres. So. You have your favorite radio station, and it plays radio that has been te focus group tested with 35 to 38-year-olds who are blue-collar workers and women, right? So everything is, is squidged down to people who like Rihanna, basically. <laughs> and that's a terrible shame. Now, on... Radio 6 International, which is my station. We have a show called Soundwave, which is presented by a guy called John Kavanagh, who is, the I think, the only uh, presenter who's who's had his own show on every single BBC radio network. One, two, three, four, five, six music, 
uh, Radio Scotland and Radio Wales and the World Service had his own show on all these stations because he's really good. The BBC got rid of him. They just kicked him out one day and they kicked him out because his programme was too, quote, eclectic. That is to say he played music. Right. He didn't play a particular genre of music. He played music that he thought you and I might enjoy hearing or might like to know about at least. Yeah. And the minute he was kicked out by the BBC, I said, come and join Radio 6, and he did. And he's now on, I think it's show 758, or something like that, this week. Mm. And every week I listen to his show and I think, gosh, gosh, I didn't know about that. Mm. Oh, that's interesting. And very often after his show, I'll go and order a CD or a vinyl right. or whatever. Right. Because he educates me. Indeed. He informs me about music. Indeed, and I think I don't know everything about it, and he doesn't. But but collectively, we we you know we plug into this. You go to an AM or FM station anywhere in the world, and all it's trying to do is just hang on to you until the next commercial break. That's mm -hmm. all it's doing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, I, I I think that what you originally started with was the word communication. Yeah. What I try to explain to people is that any art form, whether it's uh, music, sculpture, theater, whatever, is communication. Somebody has an idea and they want to communicate that idea. And what I've tried to do in all of my programs, I did a program called Inside Improvisation. And that program showed a lot of different types of improvised music and what I tried to show really was how they were the same, not how they were different. And how many of them used the same kind of musical material, scales, whatever. Uh, but but th those are the things that I find interesting is the fact that it's just another expression of the same thing. And uh, in, my, in my book here, The Invisible Artist, which I'm very cleverly putting in the frame so people can see an, an ad for it. Hell's teeth, I haven't got any of my books here. In that book, I, I picked a historical, uh, cultural area that no one knew anything about. That's why I did my original radio show called Richard Niles' History of Pop Arranging. And what I was trying to do was say, look, here's all the music that you know, but do you know who created it? Do you know who actually wrote ba -ba -ba -da -da -ba from Dancing in the Street? No, it was not the songwriter. It was the arranger. So that was what I tried to do with my book. And, and uh, that, in a way, is the, is the same thing that we're all trying to do with radio, with podcasting, with, with YouTube video channels. It's, yeah. it's all the same thing. We're trying to say, hey, look, I just found something really interesting. Would you like to know about it? So essentially, there are only two things, commercial and soul. Commercial is a bunch of grey men in grey suits. Uh, actually, these days, quite a lot of grey women in grey suits as well. Oh, yes. Totally disinterested in, in the product. Mm. All they're interested in is the marketing of it and the money they make from it. Mm. And then the soul. Soul is to do with gut feeling, joy, excitement, enthusiasm. Mm. And soul encompasses community radio, podcasts, webcasts, and YouTube channels. Mm. All of which make no money at all. But hey, let's stop for a minute and think about something else. Oh, let's think about model railways. Now, I know a lot of men who spend vast amounts of money on building their model railway collection mm -hmm. and building these little layouts with, with mm -hmm. you know, tunnels and trees and things and stations. And then they spend as much time as they possibly can running their little electric trains around their little model railways. Mm -hmm. Now, you may say that that's nuts. It doesn't achieve anything. What's the point of it? Well, the point of it is they love it. They get joy and happiness from it. Well, so right. let's all go out there and get joy and happiness 
sorry, Mike, joy and happiness from podcasting and webcasting, whatever. You will not make money out of it. But hey, you might, one, get a lot of joy out of it. And two, you just might become so damn good that you either get a job with a radio station or a TV station, or the big boys come along and say, hey, we want you, here's some money. And that does happen. Look at my friend Mark Miller. Right. Well, that's that's great for him, and 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 maybe that will happen uh, for me. But I I I don't want to be in the position that I was in, where I had all these ideas which I thought were really good, and other people thought were really good, and then to suddenly be in a position of saying, right, well, now what we want you to do is narrow it down to just this. Yeah, yeah. That's it's hellish when that happens. It's yeah. hellish when that happens. And yeah. I, I mean, it's happened to me in my lifetime many, many times. You start with something and they say, oh, hey, Tony, we'll give you this show and it's nine o'clock on a Tuesday and you can do anything you want. You play, you know, instrumentals or whatever. Yeah. I did a series called The Arrangers long, long time ago. Yes, you did. Indeed. And, and, after about seven or eight of them, somebody said to me, oh, by the way, I, I'd never heard of last week's arranger. Can you make them better known? Yeah, exactly. That's the whole point. They're not better known. And they're not well, better known. Now, how do I come to know Richard Niles? I mean, who the hell are you? How did you come to know Richard Niles? Oh, I came to know Richard Niles by a very, very simple route. Oh, yeah, that record. Yes, indeed. Now, for those of you who don't know anything about this, this is called library music. This is a piece of music, well, it's an album, produced by a company not to be commercially sold, but for film, radio, or television use. Although in this case, it was rather more contractual obligation use. It was. But I got sent loads of these. I mean, there's thousands of them on the shelves up there. But I got sent loads of these, and this particular one dropped in, dropped through the letterbox in a piece of cardboard one day, and I looked to the back of it, and I thought, wait a minute, these aren't obscure pieces of music called, you know, Waterfall Combination or anything like that. This is Space Oddity and Streets of London, Midnight in Moscow, those were the days. Fly me to the moon. So I stuck it on the turntable, and I was utterly blown away by it. Why was I blown away? because of the arrangements. I mean, just to give you a wee example. Now you ask yourself, what the hell is this? Well, it's fly me to the moon. Right, so, but immediately, immediately, I was grasped, entranced by the arrangement. And that's something that, and, and Rich has been touching on it because he's written all the books about it because he's you know, obsessed about it. But the arrangement is what makes a record work or not work. And when you're playing music on the radio or on a podcast or on a webcast or on YouTube, it's not the music that makes people listen. It's the arrangement. Now, it may be an arrangement by the people who made the music. If it's one man playing a recorder, then it's his arrangement. But that one, Fly Me to the Moon, I had never heard anybody do that to Fly Me to the Moon, yes, and that engaged I, me. I, I might just chime in here about a little bit about how the thing came about. Oh, I, please do, because it's an interesting I, story. Yeah, I was a young guy right out of uh, the Berklee College of Music, and literally the first job that I had, I got somehow signed to Essex Music. And when I got signed to Essex Music, it was because I had an idea for a musical and I uh, wrote the score in four weeks and and uh, they were impressed. So they signed me. But meanwhile, nothing happened with that. But what did happen was one of the guys at the company said, oh, you can you can arrange, can't you? And I said, well, yes, I can. And he said, well, I've got this guy who wants to this Lebanese guy who wants to make a disco record and he needs some strings and stuff. And I said, well, yeah, I can do that, but I don't really like disco music. And he said, well, he'll give you 400 pounds. 
So I said, I'll do it right away. And I did that and it was successful and they asked me to do more. But then very quickly, David Platts, who was the head of Essex Music, called me up to his office and he said, yes, I've heard some of your stuff. It's it's very good. Um, would you like to uh, do an album for us? And I said, sure, what do you want me to do? He said, we've got all these songs which are about to go out of copyright unless we record them in some way. So what we'd like you to do is we've got a real great deal with the Polish radio and TV orchestra in Poland. Yes, I figured it was in Poland. And <laughs> we'd like you to go there and do, do arrangements. And I said, well, what, what kind of size orchestra is it? And he said, whatever you want. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, they, they, their musicians are on, on call. So they, they have to be there so you can have 50 strings or 20 strings. You can have whatever you want. I said, okay. And, and that was it. And I was 24 years old. I had no restrictions. I said, do you want me to do them in any particular way? He said, no, just do them because we need it fast. And so I wrote these arrangements, went to Poland and that's how it was recorded. And it was crazy, but that was it. And it's also one of the best library albums ever made uh, because because you had carte blanche to do anything you liked with it. I mean, Creatively, I, I was not you know. restricted at all. And that's one of the great things about David Platts. You know, he didn't buy a dog and bark himself. No. Your arrangement of Fly Me to the Moon, by the way, is surpassed by your arrangement of My Kind of Girl, uh, which which Matt Monroe wouldn't really have recognized. <laughs> did, uh, but did you have the, do you have the vocal version of that? No, I don't. Is there a vocal version? Yes, there is a vocal version where I did the vocal on, over it. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I'll send it to oh, you. Oh, send me that. Send me that. It's, it's a laugh riot. Radio sometimes can influence you in a way you don't realise. Because the very first radio show I did, which was Captain Midnight in KPFK, which went out on a Saturday night at midnight in Los Angeles. And I did this Captain Midnight show, and I played an utterly totally off the wall obscure german band most weeks i did the show i did it for about a year and apparently it was it was you know must listen saturday night in los angeles nobody ever told me that they just paid me the money uh but this band i played and it was weird it was weird shit i mean it really was weird shit but i played it and uh it became globally successful mm -hmm. because I played this on the radio in Los Angeles. It was a band called Kraftwerk. Well, there you are. I thought it was, I thought it was getting get, get to Kraftwerk. You, oh, you knew where it was going. They, in fact, they took us to, they took my wife and me to dinner to thank me once. Very nice. Very nice. nice. Well, you see, the, these are the, these are the stories that, that explain why we do what we do. And, mm. uh, it's fantastic what you have done. I mean, we've only scratched the surface of all the things that you've done. And I wish we could go go into more stuff. And we probably will, because we should do this again. Yeah, um, but no need. No need. Just go to the website. So wiki me and wiki you. And that's, that's it. That's yeah, what we have to yeah. do. But we now run the radio station from Lismore. And we're on 24 hours a day. Radio6.com. R-A-D-I-O-S-I-X. Radio6.com. It's got its merits. Yes. Around the clock, around the world. Radio 6 Jazz, presented by a guy who is a really, really shit hot jazz singer. Sounds like Sinatra, Todd Gordon. Right. We have my show, which is the Lively Lounge, which is uh, pop instrumentals, including lots of stuff by Richard Niles. And in between it all, we play unsigned and indie music. That's fantastic. And our baseline is is every week we pick five more tracks and add them to a 50-track playlist of brand new music by people who don't have record contracts. Fantastic. Fantastic. Just while, while you're at it, I hope you're playing some of this. Yeah, I expect so. Yes, we are. Thank God. Banzilla, from your I local have, retailer. I have some hope of paying for breakfast. Um, Actually, we because we, we're running your your radio, Richard, on on Radio Six, and we're using the Fifth Elephant as the theme tune for oh, it. Nice. It, wor 
it it works very well. I've done a kind of Booch voiceover, and it's it's all quite good. That's very nice. Well, Come and listen. I, I look forward to hearing that, and I look forward to talking to you again, Tony. And it is so much fun because I know your voice so well. <laughs> to actually see you visually talking. Well, we haven't seen each other for quite a long time, no, have no, we? We haven't, and and not only talking, but doing. I, I had no idea that you did so many accents and you should do a whole show of you playing different characters because I think they're excellent. I used to do voices for uh, cartoon characters. Well, there you go. I, I we'll, we'll not go into that. And, and I can think of no better way to sign <laughs> off than to say, Tony Curry, it's been fantastic to talk to you. And thank, thank you, you Richard. So much. And Radio Richard says... Subscribe to Radio Richard on YouTube.